Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a little afternoon, and I guess we'll get started with the talk today. <laughs> so take your seats. Here we go. I'm Jen Blank, and I'm a former SETI employee, and uh, now I work across the street at uh, NASA Ames Research Center as an astrobiologist. And it's my pleasure to stand in for Adrian Brown, the amazing Adrian, who uh, uh, couldn't be in this part of the country today to introduce Aaron. So our speaker is Aaron Bollinger. There he is. <laughs> And he's going to talk to us today. <laughs> oh, yes, sorry, pause for applause. <laughs> okay, okay, that's the first Aaron that we've started out with applause before you talk. <laughs> so people are expecting great things. Anyway, he's going to talk with us today about um, Crucible, essentially a, a laboratory for syn synthetic biology experiments that can be used on the space station or potentially on future settlements on other planets. Aaron is a research scientist in the Bio Nano Group of Autodesk in San Francisco, and also a visiting researcher in the Arkin Lab at UC Berkeley, uh, hence the t-shirt, I assume. <laughs> he has uh, degrees in uh, engineering and aerospace engineering from Boston University, and after which he came out here to work with Chris McKay at NASA Ames Research Center. So he's currently the science uh, principal on a center innovation funds program that was just funded, just selected, right? to do the, this project on the crucible. And he's going to tell you about it now. So without further ado, um, I'll let Aaron take it away. Thanks, Aaron. Is this, is this thing on? All right, can everyone hear me? All right, goody. Goody, goody. All right, so um, thank you for the kind introduction, and, and thank you for letting me come speak here today. They usually don't let me out of the lab, so this is quite, quite special. Um, as she said, I, I work in the BioNano group of Autodesk, and I'm a visiting scientist at Berkeley, waiting for them to make me a PhD student, which they will hopefully soon. Fingers crossed. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about Project Crucible today, but before I do that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where I work, because um, they've made all this possible, and I shamelessly will talk about them whenever I can. So I work for a company called Autodesk, makes design software. Uh, basically, uh, everything you touch is designed in some way by them, and I really like that. Uh, so they're usually known for stuff like this, for cars and planes and trains and movies and whatever else they do. Uh, but they've recently started to want to make stuff like this. They want to design living systems in addition to just boring old metal systems. And so they, they spun up this bio nano group that I'm a part of, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. Uh, this is the Autodesk logo made out of DNA uh, through a process called DNA origami that we did. Um, you can fit about six million on the tip of your hair. We, we like to call it the worst marketing ever done. Um, and so uh, I work with this great team, and they, um, they do all the heavy lifting while I get to come and talk to you. Uh, you can see me there. Different, different Berkeley shirt, but uh, it's the same, same general idea. All right. So um, Autodesk wants to help people imagine, design, and create. And I want to do the same thing, only I want to do it on Mars. Don't want to be here anymore. This is sort of like me now. This is sort of me, uh, me later. If you've, ever, if you've seen the new South Parks, you'll get it. If not, watch them, and then you'll get it uh, retroactively. So um, I want to go to Mars. And uh, I'm not going to get there on the merit of my athleticism. So instead, what I decided to do was basically, instead of lose weight and become an astronaut, uh, I decided I'd build Mars in a jar, because that, that'll work, sort of. Right, so um, in order to start building this sort of Mars in a jar project, I needed a, I needed a really good team, so I'll tell you a little bit about them. Uh, there's Adam Arkin at Berkeley, who basically teaches me all the bioengineering I need. Chris McKay at NASA, who teaches me all the space sciences that I need. Uh, Dr. Carlo Quiones, who's in the back, uh, who actually did a lot of systems engineering, if not most of the systems, slash all the systems. And then uh, uh, my, my sort of boss at NASA, who um, gives me resources when I ask really nicely. It's a joke, guys. These are jokes. Come on. <laughs> All right. But the jokes are over now. So um, this is where I work in Berkeley. Uh, I work at the Energy Biosciences Building. You can come and see me if you want. If not, that's OK, too. But it's a really nice building, so you should come see it. Uh, so to get into the main sort of crux of this, um, Terraforming is sort of uh, accepted as one of the grand challenges in both space sciences and synthetic biology. Uh, we want to create this new world, and we want to do it with life. But the problem is, you know, one of the most arguable problems in this new field is we can't test uh, any of it. 
It's really hard to test things. Space has extreme environments. Mars has extreme environments. That makes it difficult to emulate in a laboratory. And um, that means you can't run tests, and it means you can't really design any of the, the biological processes. You need to, to get this done, and I don't like that. Um, and so uh, this has led to, to sort of knowledge blocks in a, in a variety of fields, including how to replicate conditions, uh, how to source and filter biology, um, how to scale experiments, all the things you'd need to actually build a, a life off-world. And we plan on meeting these capacities through the development of this chamber, which I will tell you about now. All right, so this is sort of the initial concept we had for the chamber. We made it look like the Autodesk logo again, but uh, it didn't turn out looking like that, but we wanted it to. So we decided we'd meet all of these, all of these needs, you know, replicating conditions, doing it cheaply, making it so people could use it all over, all over the world, and doing it, you know, effectively, uh, through basically using 3D printing, Internet of Things technology, um, and, and, and several of the new buzzwordy types of technology that have recently been been developed. So we started it by looking at the conditions on Mars and Earth and found that uh, Mars has a, is a pretty, pretty terrible place. Uh, it's really cold, there's no atmosphere, uh, even the atmosphere they have, it's, there's no oxygen, and we had to replicate this in a chamber that would be made from plastic. And so that was, that was going to be difficult. So once we sort of had these conditions, we made a list of requirements, like you do in a general engineering firm. Um, we basically decided that we were going to run tests first uh, through small tests, you know, small and small and steady, and break it as much as we can using just a single a single 96 well plate or a 384 well plate. Uh, we needed this chamber, which was again made of plastic, to go down to Martian conditions, which is about 0 0.5 kilopascals, which is very 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 thin. Uh, we needed it to have a very, very, very wide temperature range, um, very cold to basically standard, and we needed a very specific light intensity, which you'd find on Mars. So we got our conditions, and those are sort of the environmental conditions, and then we wanted to actually develop the, um, the sexy part of it by m making it so you could control it on your iPhone, because, you know, you can control a refrigerator on your iPhone. This is just basically a super refrigerator. So we tried to do that, too. So we looked at chambers that have already been developed. This is the chamber that uh, was developed uh, by a group in Florida. And you can see that it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice. It's made of metal, takes up a whole lab. Um, the work was, was really great when it came out. Um, but we found some problems with it. Um, it's really big, it's really heavy, limited software extensibility, because you know, it looks like, you know, looks like something made in the 90s. It's metal, so you can't modify it. If you ever need to change your experiment, you're basically done. Uh, you can't distribute it because it's a big metal block, and uh, therefore you can't really collaborate with other labs who may be interested in similar things, and that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really bode well for, for experiments. Also, it's in Florida, and I'm, I'm not going there. So, um, so we, we sort of set out and use these also as, as requirements for our, our project. So this is uh, a rendering of what it ended up looking like at the end, you see from the, from the beautiful A to the uh, flying saucer shape designed right there. All right, so we thought we'd solve these problems by uh, sort of addressing each one separately. We'd address the distribution by essentially making everything open source. Uh, we'd address the, the, the cost by making it 3D printed. 3D printing plastic is, is, is fairly cheap. It's not in Florida anymore, which is good. Um, and uh, essentially, we'd just sort of tick through each one. Um, if, you have an, if anyone has questions, please let me know, too. Happy to, happy to, uh, happy to address them. Um, so it's, bas it's basically, we'd get rid of all the old software and replace it with new software that's sexy, that you can control on your phone, that you can distribute. We replace all the hardware with, you know, essentially get rid of the metal and add 3D printing systems, making it cheap. So this is a sort of um, an image of the design when we were designing this. Um, one of the reasons uh, Autodesk lets me do this project, uh, in case you're wondering of why a design company is curious about doing this, in addition to wanting to design a new world, I also use all, all of their tools, uh, and they like that, and I find uh, the occasional bug, and I uh, develop new user stories for them. So we designed this in one of Autodesk's new products called Fusion, which is a sort of a, a web-based uh, CAD software system. It's very nice. Uh, you can design things very quickly, and it's distributed across any computer you basically use because it's on the web. So we, we designed this with Fusion. Um, the actual primary designer is right back there, so any, 
Any problems, please take them up with him. Or not, you don't have to do that. Um, so this is sort of like a, an image of the system with some of its internals. Um, the system works by essentially encapsulating your, oh, I think there's a laser point. Awesome, there's a laser point. So you can essentially put a 96 well plate in here, which is sort of like a sub chamber, and then flush coolant through the system. And we, we adopted a coolant system rather than like a, a metal Peltier reactor because one Peltier reactors, uh, I don't like them, they're difficult to wire, they're expensive, and uh, I'd have to buy a new expensive metal cooling system for every chamber I made instead of basically just stringing a bunch of chambers together and cooling them all simultaneously. So we, we thought about scale when we were doing this as well. And then essentially, these inner, inner reactors sit in 3D printed insulation, which can be made very, very, very cheaply. Um, and they also hold an electronics board here, as well as a 3D printed fluidic manifold, which controls the, the gas in and out of the system. You've got to remember, the, the gas inside of this needs to be brought to near vacuum and with essentially carbon dioxide. So that's sort of how we designed it. Uh, we rendered it with some pretty pictures using, using the Autodesk rendering service. Um, if you guys ever want to get something that, you know, if you guys ever want to make like a kitchen knife and you want it to look really nice, you can use the rendering systems. So we rendered it a couple times, found that it was really beautiful, check, 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 because that's important. And then we decided to move on to some of the more hardcore engineering like you'd find with simulation. So we wanted to actually simulate this and make sure that it, you know, it wouldn't, break or do anything terrible when we started flushing it with essentially silicon oil that was <laughs> very, very cold. So we, oh, go back. So we, you do this by creating, um, I don't know if anyone, I'm sure everyone here has done this, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. So um, that being said, you just basically make fluid models, which you can do very easily, seal them up, assign materials to them, and then assign some boundary conditions, mesh the system, all of which can be done rather simply with our software. And then um, you can generate uh, you can generate your uh, sort of your velocity profiles, your your uh, pressure pressure profiles here, and your and your uh, distribution profiles there. So you can basically distribute it. Uh, we ran it with a with a series of sensors built into the software. Are you? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I was going to show that later. So the system's about this big, about this big. Uh, yeah. I ruin everything. Capturing the questions. So I like the idea of being able to um, have uh, questions during the talk, and, and and as do you, I guess. But if you take a question, would you re please repeat it so we can capture it? Awesome. Thanks. Sorry for ruining everything. No, thank you. All right. Um, the question was, how big is it? It's a great question. Always a great question. Uh, it's about this big, uh, if I had to say. And um, it's essentially, we made it small like that so that we could essentially make a, a bunch of them, scale them easy. If you look at the, the, the previous system we modeled it after, it's like this big. It's really big. Um, and it takes up a whole lab. And uh, if I wanted to like bring it to a high school to show kids how to use it or, or you know, bring it to a, a college and show those kids how to use it, it would, I'd, I'd have to get a crane. And I don't want to get a crane. So um, we made it small. How much does it weigh? It's really light. You can throw it. Uh, it's essentially all 3D printed plastic. And I'll show you the tool pathing in just a moment, which is essentially how you do the 3D printing. But it's designed to be light because air is a good insulator. So you want the insulation, which is the primary component of most of the bulk, to be essentially light weighted with enough uh, pathways inside so that it can actually seal at a vacuum. And you're, did you? Yeah, OK, good. All right, go. Hooray! So this was uh, some of the simulation data that we got. We essentially found that if we uh, if we input minus 80 degrees, we can you know this is over a course of one hour. We can drop it down to, to nearly the temperature we need. Um, if we if we run the simulations for longer, we accumulate a lot of data, but we can reach it after about three and a half hours, which is good, or about uh, about six and a half hours. We can reach our target temperature, which is way colder than we need. Most cells are going to die way sooner than that. So um, moving right along, we also measure temperature at the point that it comes in. We measure the temperature of the board to make sure we're not spilling liquid silicon oil anywhere. Uh, and then uh, pressure, pressure readings. And this is just the Mark I. In some of the, the later steps, we'll have uh, growth, growth data as well, which we can also measure. 
So these are some, some nice simulation data. You can sort of see how it works. You sort of flush coolant through here, and it gets cold over a certain amount of time. It's, it's obvious. I mean, don't need to explain the thermodynamic laws to you guys. I'm pretty sure we all get cold, especially today. It's kind of cold today. So this is essentially how the system works. Basically, a box, you flush coolant inside, you keep it at a vacuum, and you put cells in it, and they keep dying. And that's what we want, cheaper than going to Mars. So this is sort of a, a diagram of how we fabricated this. We, th we 3D printed this primarily with, with one main 3D printer with, uh, with two others to do some of the peripheral pieces. Um, so this sort of uh, answers, answers your question about how light it is. This is a di this is a diagram that shows the different tool pathing we do. For those of you who don't know how to, uh, who have never done 3D printing, tool pathing is essentially how you control uh, the, the the pattern that's infilled inside of a 3D printer if you use a, a, a thermoplastic printer. So we adopted a, just a, a very very nice hexagonal pattern here, which 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 helps with the lightness, and then concentric rings around areas where we really uh, needed a better seal. Um, and this actually proved really difficult for us in the beginning. Uh, controlling these tool paths is very difficult because the software to run this type of 3D printer, which is uh, made by Stratasys, which is called a Fortis 450, is very old, very, very, very old. Autodesk doesn't make it, or else it wouldn't be so old. But um, it's very old. And uh, we had to sort of adopt a, a, a method of doing this inside of the new type of Fusion software, where we actually break down a solid body object into a series of layers, and then for each layer, apply a specific tool path would be, which would be read by this uh, old archaic software here. But it worked, and we were able to reach near vacuum uh, just basically by melting plastic in a, in a series of patterns, which I don't think anyone's done before. So huzzah! <laughs> All right. For some of the more peripheral pieces, such as this uh, fluidic manifold here, which is how you control the, the gas in, we can use either the, the Form 1 printer, which is a different type of 3D printer. It's called uh, an SL. Essentially, essentially, they're light printers. So instead of melting plastic, you essentially cure liquid resin. And we can do that with either the Autodesk printer or the Form 1 printer. And then for some of the pretty pieces, which show everybody's logo, we'll use a really expensive 3D printer that, that resolves very nice detail. Because if, you, if your logo's not on it, what's the point? <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. So um, in addition to just being a box, there's also some rather complicated electronics that run this. We don't just want a box where you stick a hose inside. That's, um, that's an old refrigerator. I want one of those new sexy refrigerators that tells me what time it is, too. So we do that by essentially, oh, oh, oh geez, nope. All right, by, by essentially uh, making our own uh, board here, and I'll show you about how we, we do the integration later, but we essentially have uh, our own sort of 3D, our own uh, circuit, which talks to an Arduino, which talks to a Raspberry Pi, so we have an integrated system which can control the, all, of the, um, all of the pumps and valves and lights. So we design, do you have a question? That's a great question, no. Um, n not this one, they, oh. Uh, so the question was, does Autodesk make this, the schematic capture tool? Is that what you said? Uh, uh, the answer was no. They don't make this tool. This is a, uh, an, open, an open one where you can share designs f uh, sort of freely and easily, and that was what our, um, that was what our, our partner uh, sort of first used, and so we adopted it. They do make a, a circuits tool, um, and they have another one coming out soon which will be integrated into Fusion, which I'm sure we'll use. We just haven't quite integrated it yet. Great question. Um, all right, good. So uh, we designed these boards. We had them, we had them uh, manufactured. Um, I assume this talk will be publicly available, so if anyone has any uh, hardcore electronics questions about these boards, uh, you can grab them here. But essentially, you have, you have one. Th these, are, these are one circuit board, and then we have one sensor board here. Um, Sensor is actually in the chamber, and then the circuit is on the outside, as you saw in one of the previous, previous documents. So in addition to having an elegant you know, sort of sensor array system and a, and a, and a sort of a brain on board, we, we wanted to actually make it interesting to look at data. I know that's not always um, possible, especially when you have time series data that's basically just a, 
you know, a temperature over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and so we adopted one of the new pieces of software that Autodesk developed called uh, Data360, which is a time series, it's like a web time series database where you can essentially give the system a hardware model, like a, typically it's done with buildings where you have thermostats and temperatures and sensors all over the, all over the, all over the building, and then you can sort of model the system and point to different temperatures in different rooms and get uh, sort of graphs on the fly. So we adopted that, um, uh, and while we were working on that, we also developed a, uh, a sort of a very, very, very basic web app which would allow us to test the system um, essentially on your phone or on your computer and just set temperatures, and they'd go and they'd change and all that kind of stuff. So we could verify it while we were building a more elaborate web app, which we're still in the process of building. So this is, um, this is more about the process system here. So you capture, you process, you store, and then these talk to a visualizing system and an, analy uh, an analysis system, so you can actually analyze your data on the fly. Uh, this is really good if you've ever worked with any sort of databasing, uh, where you basically, databases are not meant to essentially store the same value over and over and over and over again. It makes them very big and bulky, but, uh, but this has a way of dealing with it that makes it so my system doesn't crash after running for two and a half hours which is good, because I, I don't want seven petabytes of data, which is essentially the same number. That would get boring. Well, maybe like a little change every now and then. So this is, um, this is how we integrated the whole, the whole system together. Uh, as I said before, you have sensors on the, on, the, on the main board. You have your pressure sensor, your temperature, se uh, temperature sensors, and your light sensors. They're essentially controlled by an Arduino, which is just a little micro slave. They talk to a Raspberry Pi, which talks to a, which talks to a, a server, which talks to your web, um, your web interface. So you can control it. So you go through many layers and then program each one to do what you want. Um, and then, uh, you know, going back, if you if you basically give a command at the web UI, it'll talk to the Raspberry Pi, either control the temperature system from there directly, or actually go through the Arduino and control the valves, which control the pressure and the atmospheric composition, and control the LED from there. And then connected to the actuators, you have a pump and a and um, and uh, you have a pump with premixed gas. So essentially, you can swap out the components really quickly and and get to the get to the system you need, and that's sort of what the point of this was. So here's our, our sort of target web app. This data is uh, sort of junk data for right now. This is actually from a building. But this is sort of what the target web app will look like when we're done with it. You can see the crucible chamber here, different sensors inside of it, and you can pull it apart with these tools here, and then um, sort of get the data you want when you want it in a pretty form, and then share it with other people so you can actually post this online and show the whole world what you're doing or not if you're, if you're you know, a Grinch. So this is what it looks like when it's all assembled. Uh, this should address the size question here. Um, it's, I think it's quite nice. Inside you can see, oh gee, stupid thing. Inside you can see the O-rings here, the sensor array here, uh, sort of just collapses inside where you stick your 96 well plate. Um, Pretty simple little little Mars in a jar. Um, but I think the really exciting thing about this project is uh, it's more than a Mars in a jar if you can make a lot of Mars in a jar. And I think that's kind of where the, the sexy, powerful part of this is. Um, Autodesk likes democratization, and so do I. I like, it when, uh, I like it when people prove me wrong. I like it when people take something I've built and they build something way better and make me look like a fool, which I hope some of you will do. Um, I don't like looking like a fool, but I like it when other people look way better. So we do that by essentially open sourcing all of the components in this so anybody can build one of these if they have a 3D printer uh, or if they just want to order one from a 3D printing company. Essentially, the software is all available on, um, on GitHub. Uh, the, the links for these will be changing, but I think when we post the video of this, we'll, we'll upload the newest link. Uh, the electronics are available freely. You can get access to these now and post comments and tell us where we screwed up. And the hardware is currently unavailable because we're still cleaning up some of the some of the design modifications we've done, um, but they will be publicly available, and so anybody can fork the fork the code and make their own code, or fork the hardware designs and redesign it from anything they'd like. The hardware designs for this were actually inspired by a 3D printed oven, 
So this shows you sort of the power of 3D printing and design when you can just fork the code and change it and make it do the exact, literally the exact opposite of what it was supposed to do. Um, now, I, I've talked a lot about how we build this, but I haven't talked about what we, what we use it for. Um, so this a uh, little bit of, I, and that's because Berkeley wants me to publish the papers, and so uh, they, they say, you know, keep it under your hat, but I don't listen, so here it goes. So um, this sort of is, a, is a, a radar plot that shows different conditions we can control, and inside of these conditions we can actually uh, sort of replicate Mars within this uh, feasible region here. So the crucible provides this ability to carry out experiments under these extreme conditions, as I just said. And essentially what we want to do is we want to combine the fact that we can grow something or basically just kill something in the chamber with the ability to read the genes that were um, turning on and off or essentially providing fitness data for what was happening. So essentially what, what some of the folks from Florida did with their chamber is they said, we can throw cells inside and watch them die. And I'm saying what we can do when we combine this with Berkeley's randomly barcoded transposon mutagenesis methods is we can throw them inside and watch them die and then do a, a sort of a genetic autopsy. And we can provide the fitness data for which genes are going to be uh, responsible for some of the adaptations you get. So we essentially do this. Um, we do this so we can get gene databases of which genes we think would be useful if we were trying to build an organism that could withstand life on another planet. So that's why we do it. Um, I'm not just like a monster who kills cells for no reason. Um, so we, yeah, so, so we, we do this by essentially using this process called, um, called randomly barcoded transposon mutagenesis, which, which uh, my lab at Berkeley, or which the lab at Berkeley from which I am from developed. I don't, want to, I don't want to pretend I developed this. Um, and you essentially do this by creating a mutant library of whatever cell you'd like with transposons. And then they essentially have little, little barcoded elements that mutate your, 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 your genetic system. And then we kill whatever we want or we grow whatever we want. We measure the growth. Then we take out the cells, uh, basically rip them apart, measure what was... Um, uh, measure the genes based on those tags, and then correlate that with how they were growing or how they were surviving. So you basically get a nice fitness plot which correlates the genes and the environments, which I think is the most interesting. Question? About the environment. Um, huh? We don't have any measure of how many volatile organics have been cut off of plastic. So that's a really good... Oh, so the question was... I got, I got it this time. The question was, I don't have any measure of any volatiles that come off the plastics. That's a great question. I'm sure you've seen that some of the data from like Oreos and the other missions, they off-gas when you, when you do that. And I think, um, I think we mitigate that by, by, with a couple reasons. One of them is we use a permeable layer on top of the 96-well plate that allows for gas exchange. Um, but I think most of the gas exchange is going to be pulled out when we apply a negative pressure. So I think you're going to have that. And I think the other, the other important fact is most of those plastics that, they, that really off-gas are things after you've applied cleaning to them. So if you've seen the microfluidic systems where they put them on the satellites, uh, they apply um, essentially, a, they, they, they flush it with a very, very toxic gas which produces free radicals which get trapped in the plastic. We don't need to do any of that post-processing. Although it's a great question. Uh, also, we're not using a, a, a typically like if you've so you've seen the literature where the three D printing plastic off gases, these are, I don't think we're using typically off gassing plastics, but it's good. We could look into that. Yeah. What is the atmosphere? What is the atmosphere inside of the chamber? The question is, what is the atmosphere inside the chamber? So the atmosphere inside the chamber is essentially ninety five percent carbon dioxide, two or three percent nitrogen, maybe two percent argon. So it's essentially the Martian atmosphere. Mars in a jar. Question? Yeah. That's this. Uh, you got it. So the 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 question was, we can change the atmosphere exactly. We 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 didn't want it coupled, you know, to a big big system like that. You can essentially just. Uh, We've, we've talked about doing something like this where we, we add a, a component to the Arduino which can control the valves on a, on, a gas, on a gas manifold, and then you can mix it on the fly, but currently you can just swap out a tank. 
pre-order a tank or whatever you'd like, or stick it into the wall. Yeah? So currently we're still in prototype. I would say uh, if I had to 3D print one of these right now, it would probably cost a, maybe about $800 to 3D print one of these fully. Carlo can give you the exact numbers over there. Uh, but the electronics, if we, if we were making these at scale, I imagine we could produce one for about a little less than 10 grand, I'd say, which is, um, I think, cheaper than it would cost to buy a block of metal and mill it. Um, but we're, we're doing the cost analysis now. That was one of the original goals, after all. All right. Um, I talked about that. All right, so um, obviously I'm here to talk about this because I, uh, we were awarded the SIF grant. I want to clarify that I am not the science PI on this. I'm an unofficial science PI. Chris McKay is the real science PI, and I have no um, responsibilities whatsoever. So any, any um, bureaucracy-related work, uh, talk to Chris McKay. Uh, uh, certainly, certainly not me. And don't tell him I said to do that. Um, so um, we can provide data on, on what we originally proposed if anyone has any question. So we've already built prototypes of this, and we plan on building new prototypes with new capabilities, such as growth, uh, essentially growth and fitness uh, measurement capabilities, better handling of some of the SEALs, uh, sexier web app, that kind of thing. So that's why I'm here, in case anybody was curious. Um, uh, you can apply now. We, we won the grant, and that's, that's great. Um, I'm certainly not taking any of the money. Uh, we, we essentially did this so we can hire someone on to work on this. Um, this is a bunch of gobbledygook that I'm not going to read, but um, we've just found that the, uh, the job rec just hit the NASA space portal, so we'll link that when we create the video for this. And anybody who wants to do this can apply. Uh, if, you, if you're a hardware engineer, certainly apply, or a software engineer, or, or an electronics engineer. And we'd really love your help, uh, or not. And we'll pay you, and you get to work at NASA. So everybody wins, probably. Um, it, I think it's important to note that I, I started my career with a grant like this. And I think these grants are, are really, really great. And although NASA probably doesn't love me personally for my time spent on that grant, um, I think the grants are really valuable. Um, and obviously this is important to NASA because it, it goes right into the, the roadmap alignment in, in situ resource utilization and sustainability. Um, and I know NASA really values these roadmaps, and so I'm happy to oblige by stating why this is important for them. All right, cool. So, uh, just a quick note about the people who've who've helped me helped me do this. Um, there's the people at Autodesk, uh, Eli Groben and Larry Peck, who essentially fund me. Uh, Drew Hilbert at at Autodesk, who essentially writes a, a lot of the code now, um, and some of the others who did the the renderings and some of the other software. Uh, at, at Berkeley, uh, Adam Arkin is my PI. If you have questions on the, the randomly barcoded transposon mutagenesis techniques, uh, please talk to him and the, the people who work under him who make that possible. Chris McKay, who submitted this grant uh, with me and, and helps me with the, the planetary science. And then, of course, Carlo, uh, who's at the back of the room, who, who does a lot of the systems engineering, if not all of it. All right. So, questions, comments, concerns? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Let's I'm sure I'm doing this all wrong. No, I apologize. No, this is very interesting, Aaron. Awesome. So, let's first start by thanking Aaron for this talk. It's really awesome. <laughs> and now we'll move to the formal question part of the talk. And for that, I'm going to ask you to hold your question until I bring you the microphone so we can capture it for the YouTube video. First question, I think it was someone back here. It was, it was that gentleman. Thanks, great talk. Um, on your radar plot, you mentioned radiation, and you show uh, your experiment can go about 50% to the, to the end of the, of the bar. And mm -hmm. uh, a question, how is that done, and how can you uh, simulate the really hard radiation that the Mars, Mars uh, soil would be submitted to? So great, one great eye. So uh, the question is the, the radiation. Um, I think there are different ways we could do this. We can essentially just increase the intensity of the light. We get a really powerful light, and uh, we, I mean, like, what do you mean? But it depends on what you mean by radiation. I'm not going to be applying cesium 
you know, cesium uh, gamma radiation to this. They won't let me do that. In fact, if you try and get access to the cesium source at NASA, it's really bad. Um, it's like under a building with like guards and stuff. So like, I obviously am not going to get any get any of that or cobalt sixty or anything like that. But you can buy lights that have the appropriate solar flux. Carlo. Hey Aaron, thanks for putting that together. There's a lot of information you packed in there. I just wanted to follow up on a couple of the points. Here we go. Um, so I'll just, as an aside, some of the more interesting stuff that we figured out in doing uh, Crucible was how to do airtight uh, prints using FDM printers. Um, that, that was its own separate challenge. So we get airtight parts with minimal or no post-processing off of uh, the normal FDM printers. And finally, how to um, design infill for thermal insulation properties. So we designed uh, algorithms for closed cell 3D printed insulation. Um, and there's, uh, it, it's really interesting diving into some of those details. But then some other questions I think we had about off-gassing. So the materials we're using right now are ABS, which are not ideal for that. But uh, the one of the advantages of using the Fortis machines is that they're one of the few 3D printers that can work with um, Ultem, polyether imid. Uh, and there's grades of that that are very, very low outgassing. And um, regardless of the way Crucible designed, uh, any off gas, um, any gases would be diluted quickly because it's not a totally sealed chamber. There's always a minimal amount of uh, new atmosphere being uh, let in and simultaneously pulled back out. So it's not a totally closed system. Um, and any off gas would be diluted away. And finally, the cost. Uh, for 3D printing and getting a uh, turnkey PCB fab, um, like one of everything kind of thing, it's probably about $4,000 for the whole kit. Um, but you can get huge discounts on that, especially if you already have a 3D printer or you know can build the board yourself. They're not th very hard. Um, that doesn't include the cost of the equipment. The, the ultra low temp circulator is about 25 k and vacuum pumps about 2000 but a lot of labs have one or both of those things lying around. Right, so the typical university setting where you might already have access to a 3D printer and cheap labor to assemble stuff and thermalators and vacuum pumps, uh, you're looking at the cost of materials, which actually for all time can be expensive, but they're still probably around $800. Actually, could you just comment you, a little bit more on the, the, the fact that this is, did you say, Aaron, that this was the first sort of design where you'd or been able to achieve a vacuum seal? Uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. I haven't found any in the literature. Yeah, sealing FDM parts is typically considered uh, not feasible. It's not feasible when you just print them. You can seal FDM parts with acetone, but this is the first one with no post-process. That's important. Thank you. I'm coming down Boiling to the next question. Well, it seems that to me that the purpose of all this is to get Earth organisms to adapt to a Martian environment. It's to test how they respond to a, a Martian environment. Obviously, nothing is going to actually survive in a Martian environment. It's most likely seeing, you can use this to assess the limit at which they can survive as you, um, as you go towards that environment. So now, if obviously, if I take a cell, even if I kept evolving it, nothing's going to survive on Mars with that kind of uh, environment, but what I can do is I can find a limit to which they survive, and then I can make future mission parameters specific to that. So if I have, you know, if I'm colonizing Mars, I can I can heat the soil up to a specific point, but I don't have to heat it all the way up, you know. So I, I can find the the limiting points which save save so, money. So you much. don't basic assumption is that you can't contaminate Mars with Earth organisms. That's not a worry because it's not possible. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't mess with the planetary protection people because uh, I don't want to get into a fight. So um, I don't know. I, it's probably a good assumption. Um, I mean, we're not working with tardigrades. Uh, certainly nothing that's metabolizing. Well, if you go down deep, uh, I mean, under the Martian soil, you get down to there's permafrost, and then presumably deeper, you're below permafrost, and Earth organisms could survive. I'd like to see that proved. I, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, probably. But again, um, 
I don't want to get into a fight with the planetary protection people by making any statements like that. Right now, we're just testing to see how they survive. We're not shipping anything there yet. Next question. Back here. Yeah. So I think I saw the, the lowest temperature um, in the range for the crucible was minus 150 centigrade. Is that correct? No, crucible can go down to about minus 80 right now. Although oh. I haven't tested it for anything lower than that okay. because uh, to get I, something that cold would be very difficult. Right okay. now we can drop it down to minus 80, maybe minus 90. Okay, because I was thinking about Titan in a box and what that would take. Because I know Chris McKay and Titan and Life on Titan <laughs> are big. <laughs> I'm sure that was his goal the whole time. <laughs> it's not enough to make Mars. He wants Titan. Okay, you have uh, control over the ultraviolet and the atmosphere. You get uh, uh, what uh, Martian pressure, CO2, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Could you use this to make a, uh, a, a Martian soil simulant that is more accurate than, than what we can do here? Uh, yeah, maybe build up the... Uh, peroxides and uh, so on, so you you're actually got something that looks to the bugs like Mars. We're investigating it. Um, obviously, you can buy JSC regolith, regolith, which is minerally equivalent, and you can add peroxides and perchlorates and whatever you want, and then you can put it in the chamber and see how it works. But um, we're, we're investigating it. Great question. Hi. Uh, the other um, the, uh, uh, there's now, because of the ISS, um, data on, on, on critters in microgravity, and we have lots of data on critters on Earth. The one thing you can't simulate is Martian gravity. Is there any theory as to what that level of gravity m might, might affect the cells, if at all? I think I've seen some research on this. Obviously, we have no plans on testing the microgravity of this. We could adopt it for use on the ISS, so you can, I'm sure you can make systems. I think I've seen some where you use water, like pulling, and it makes a, a like an effective microgravity. I think I've read something on that, but uh, we have no plans on that. You could use a centrifuge too, but I, I wouldn't centrifuge this stuff just yet. Aaron, I think one of the space apps challenges in, involved um, looking at uh, microbe or cell response to um, microgravity Mars conditions. Did you have any input from any of that community? And this is this is an open or an annual sort of competition that anyone around the country or world can work on remotely. We have and, not. Okay, well, remind me. I but I would like yeah, to. Yeah, cool. Um, next question. Um, okay. Well, right, if anyone, goody. if any of you would like to come up and talk with Aaron after, please feel free to do so. And let's thank him one more time. And you should be able to find this on the SETI YouTube channel in about a week. Thanks, Aaron.